Hello everyone, my name is Mer Lafferty and I have the honor of being here virtually at ReaderCon 31 and interviewing our guest of honor, Ursula Vernon, aka T. Kingfisher. Hi Ursula. Hi Mer. Hi ReaderCon. You know, I realized that we probably could have done this in person because we're both vaccinated and we live near each other, but now it looks all, you know, neat and on the internet like everyone is used to. High tech, yes. Yes, high tech indeed. Indeed. So um, I thought it would be interesting to sort of, if there are anybody out there who wants to follow in the footsteps of the Ursula Vernon T. Kingfisher career, we should go over the advice for them. Because oh it's, it, it, you know, you really traveled a regular path that is well trod, but maybe you can offer a little bit of uh, things here and there that they might not have thought of. Yes, my, my career has been 100% duplicatable by anyone, surely. Indeed. So we'll start with the, um, the children's books. How many children do you have, Ursula? Uh, I have two stepsons who are both adults and out of the house. Uh, so effectively zero. So how did you get, to t tell me the very regular way you got the gig to start writing children's books. Well, I, uh, I was an artist. Uh, I was an illustrator and I was doing lots of paintings and things. And I have a kid brother uh, who is 25 years younger than me, 23 years younger than me. Uh, because there was an accident with an herbal supplement and a vasectomy that reversed itself. And um, I decided I would, I had a vague idea I would try to write a book for him. Nothing came of it at the time, but I had done an illustration or two. I put it online and then I accidentally got an agent. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, <clears throat> so uh, I suppose my first advice for anyone wishing to have my career is to befriend a well-known romance writer at the coffee shop and finally get around to reading a romance novel and say something funny about it so that they can repeat this story at a dinner for romance writers with the agent sitting next to them. And the agent, my now agent said, uh, artist, uh, does she do graphic novels? They're super hot right now. And I did, was, in fact, doing a graphic novel. I was writing a graphic novel called Digger. Uh, it was a webcomic. And uh, my friend, Deb from the coffee shop, said, yes, I think she does. And then Deb called me up and said, do you want a literary agent? And she has never let me forget that what I said was, yeah, sure, what the hell? <laughs> because I knew nothing about it. You know, everything I knew about writing was from... Uh, the 80s when I wanted to be a writer and my grandmother had bought me a subscription to Writer's Digest and people very rarely had agents back then so it was not really a, a thing that they didn't tell you how to get agents so that getting agents was difficult just that it was a thing you could sort of do if you wanted maybe but most people didn't have them. Uh, I would later learn that this is not the way one normally gets an agent and that it is not actually that easy uh the agent called me up or first emailed me a couple of times and was like do you have representation and i said i pay taxes and i don't live in washington dc so yes and she <laughs> revised her opinion down of what she was dealing with uh, she looked at my website and seen all these art and weird little stories i was writing under them and was like uh, do you have a literary agent? And I'm like, no, I've never spoken to a literary agent. Then the phone rang about five minutes after I sent the email. And she said, you are now speaking to a literary agent. And I was like, cool. Okay. <laughs> and she uh, had seen the little drawing I had done of a shrew in a snail shell boat that I was thinking about doing as a children's book for my brother, who, you know, at the time had, I forget how old he was by then. Uh, and she said, uh, can you actually write a book based on this? Well, first it was send me the graphic novel, et cetera, et cetera. Can you write a book based on this story? And I was like, yes, I can do that. I had never done anything like that, but I figured how hard could it be? And I, uh, the problem was I didn't know how long it takes to write a book. 
I was used to illustration turnarounds. And so I figured, you know, a children's book, they're short. They shouldn't take any longer than uh, a particularly complex illustration, right? So I, and I didn't want her to, you know, decide I was taking too long and go with somebody else because I was still thinking she was like an art director or something. And so I said, uh, can I have six weeks? And my agent said very graciously, and I did not realize at the time that she was probably joking, why don't you take eight? <laughs> and I was like, eight? Okay, that's even better. That way I can get it done in six. I can send it in early and have time for all the revisions it needs in two weeks. Again, I was working on art director illustration turnarounds. So I did that. And it's only a 15,000 word book, uh, NERC, the, the adventure of a somewhat brave shrew. So it didn't take that long to write. I just sat down and wrote it, you know, very rapidly and uh, sent it to my agent. And she was, I believe, extremely astonished to get it in six weeks and was like, this is adorable. Uh, yes, I will send it to publishers. And I was like, great, sounds good. And she did. And uh, one of them bought it. And they gave me $15,000, which was more money than I had ever seen in one place in my entire life. And I was like, wow, this, this writing thing is good. I'm, <laughs> I'm up for that. Uh, I should do more of that. It turns out it's not always that easy. And uh, in fact, uh, many other things happened. The book got orphaned twice. But that turned out okay because the editor, who was the second person who orphaned it, uh, by orphan it means the, the editor uh, leaves that publishing house and the book no longer has a cheerleader or champion basically to take it through marketing. Uh, the second editor also left and at that point the book was doomed. It sank like a rock. But she bought the next series I was pitching, which was the Dragon Breath series, which was a hybrid graphic novel for kids, which was indeed very hot right then. My agent was right. And... Uh, Somewhere in there, I asked my agent very nervously, does this mean you're my agent now? <laughs> and she was like, what? Yes, of course. Wait, has another agent been talking to you? And I'm like, no, no, there's no one else. I just didn't know if this was, you know, it's like, yes, I'm, I'm your agent. Uh, you, and you can, yeah. So okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you here because I'm taking notes. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, make, make friends with friends the local romance writer. writer. Then an agent will call you. You can be entirely ignorant of book writing time, and then you'll get fifteen thousand uh, dollars. Those are the first. Four. It also helps to have been doing a web comic for several years before that. Sure. I think uh, that that sets you up for some of these things. Oh, and have a website full of art you've you've made. And uh, uh, yes, and to do the web comic and everything else, uh, you need to have been very nice to one particular individual on a mud back in the day, who. Uh, uh, well, if you can, if you can't find a mud anymore, I don't know what the equivalent is now. MMO, Second Life. Uh, yes, I was nice to someone one day because they were a newbie and it was a fantasy mud and they needed armor. So I went and, and fought some monsters and got them armor and we were chatting and we struck up a acquaintance and she introduced me to the writer. Well, first she got her husband, got my husband a job in North Carolina. So we moved there from Arizona. And then she introduced me to Deb at the coffee shop, who was also Sabrina Jeffries, who happened to know this agent. And, uh, and she also introduced me to the editor who, of the webcomic site, who wound up making getting Digger a lot more fame. So, uh, okay, basically, in order to further your career, go back to uh, 2001 and uh, be nice to a newbie in a mud. One particular okay. newbie, yes. <laughs> oh. 
Oh yeah. Uh, well, what need what happens then, or what happened in my case? Uh, my they and I, I felt so bad for the editor because, of course, it's never the editor who is making the decision how much to pay you. They would love to pay all of their authors scads of money, but the word had come from on high: "Thou shalt cut things," because I believe the cost of paper had just gone up dramatically, and so printing costs were up. And they were all, okay. Uh, see if we can cut costs by offering less money to some of these people. So I believe it was the fourth Dragon Breath book, and they came back and offered me less money. And that is that is not a thing you do. Uh, it is it is bad form. My agent uh, tried for oh, about a week to get a hold of the basically the the person who was giving my editor the orders on this and was getting shunted to voicemail and ignored and she was like all right we're gonna pass on this offer and i have it you know this was all i had ever done uh this was i was like this was a great career while it lasted now i go back to uh drawing furry art for money which was frankly my primary income stream and uh so and she's like okay we're passing on this deal and don't talk to your editor i was like yeah yes ma'am uh well actually this was a, a, a message a voicemail it was don't talk to your editor i'm like oh god oh god my career is over so i try to call my agent and i can't get a hold of her and about five minutes later my editor calls me and is like oh my god oh my god we are so sorry we did not mean to disrespect you we, we are sorry you felt hurt. I'm like, I had no idea I felt hurt, but I didn't say that out loud. Apparently, my agent had been stressing how, how upset I was. And uh, this is why some people like me really need agents, because they would have just offered me a pittance, and I would have been, thank you for the pittance, ma'am. And uh, so she's like, you know, this is, this is terrible. We will work something out. And I'm like, I don't think I'm even allowed to talk to you right now. I'm very sorry. It's been great working with you. I hope we can work together in the future. And she's like, yes, yes, of course you can't Right? Okay. Tell your agent to call me. I try. She's not answering her phone. I call my agent again. Still nothing. I uh, leave frantic voicemails, nothing. I call my friend Deb from the coffee shop and lament that my career is over. Uh, Deb assures me this happens all the time and my career is not over and it will be fine. Uh, I try my agent again. I can't get a hold of her. I am in a panic. I call my husband and oh my God, my career is over. Oh God. And finally, I get a text from my agent saying, I am not playing a hardball. I have been trapped in an elevator for an hour. Uh, we have finally gotten close enough to a floor that I have signal. So Yes, I will handle this as soon as I get out of the elevator. So we got more money. So I, I believe the uh, the moral of this story is that uh, when negotiations get tough, have your agent pass uh, and then be stuck in an elevator. Yes, brand separation. Yes. Uh, I had always, well, okay, when you write for children, and writing for children is very difficult in a lot of ways, because uh, for one thing, there are things you are just not allowed to do, and I not having, I was an only child up until the, the I had moved out and gotten to college by the time my brother came along. I have never changed a diaper in my life. Uh, my my stepsons were preteens by the time I got in there and had moved into the I'm going to sit in my room and grunt and eat all the food in the house stage very quickly. So I uh, I ha am a bad judge of what is allowed to go into a children's book. And every time your editor says this is not appropriate for children, it's too gory, it's too weird, it's too freaky. It's too scary. Uh, you like shove it down into this place in your chest that eventually compresses like diamond. And you're finally, I'm gonna write something and I am gonna do every single thing they have not allowed me to do. 
uh, which is how I started writing horror novels. Uh, the fantasy, I had been sort of writing fantasy novels that were definitely for adults, but I hadn't published any of them because uh, I had this whole children's book thing going on and it hadn't really occurred to me. And then one day I was like, wait, I am a writer. I have written, I could finish these other books. And I wrote a novella called Nine Goblins. I tried to sell it uh, to the children's book places and they were like, this is not a children's book. We don't know what it is. We enjoy it, but we don't know what it is. We have no idea how to market it, which is a refrain that comes up a lot in my life. So I was like, wait, self-publishing is a big thing now. I will learn to self-publish. But again, you don't want some, you know, the, the kid who loves all the Dragon Breath books to grab the book with the corpses piled to the ceiling. So, uh, and the swearing and everything. So I thought I will do a pen name. And I self-published uh, Nine Goblins as T. King Fisher, and it did well. People gave me money, and I was like, this is awesome. I could do more of this. And so I did. Uh, I wrote some fairy tale. Well, it, and again, it was the thing. I, I wrote The Seventh Bride. I tried to sell it as a children's book. Uh, my editor and agent did not exactly laugh in my face, but that was strongly implied at the fact that I had thought it was a children's book. When I later had my self-pub editor edit it, she just was making notations through the whole manuscript. And this is when you realized it wasn't a children's book, right? This has to be when you realized it wasn't a children's book, right? Uh, no, it was, it was a long way after that. Uh, so, and then once I had realized it wasn't a children's book, finally I cut loose and started doing all kinds of weird things. And I published that and it did well. And so I just kind of kept going to have something to do with these other things I was writing that were clearly not children's books, even though at the time I had started them, sometimes I had thought they would be children's books. And finally I gave up on ever thinking they would be children's books and just embraced the, the weirdness. Uh, the horror novels came about, oh God, this is another one of those career things. Uh, make a note, Burr, that anyone wishing to follow in my footsteps as a horror author should make a joke on Twitter about the worst elevator pitch they have ever done, which was, it's like the Blair Witch Project meets the Andy Griffith show and why their agent puts up with a lot. And an editor who I knew in passing, uh, well, more than in passing, I mean, we, we, we hadn't like hung out, but we knew each other online, uh, DM'd me and was like, is this a real book? Well, yes. So, is it for children? No. Has anyone bought it? No. Send it to me. Okay. And so I did, and uh, she came back like a couple days later and was like, well, I started reading it and then I heard a noise from my kid's room and I lay paralyzed in bed going, I have to go save him from the monster, but I kind of want to just climb on top of the refrigerator and hide. So uh, that's how I sold that book. So pitching so ideas sorry. on Twitter is like gold. Uh, pitching ideas that you didn't realize was you were pitching. Uh, the, you're making a joke on Twitter about a pitch, yes, is, oh God, just hearing this, I, I'm starting to hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. If this is this is not how you get a career. Do it the right way, the normal way, the, the, the sensible way. Uh, mine is purely, uh, apparently I put a lot of points into luck as a uh, stat. Yeah, I'd say so. And I'm having fun because I just realized that my mic was off for part of that because my dog was barking. So I'm going to have to oh, figure no. out how to fix that. So um, you have, uh, honestly speaking, I think a lot of your success has come from the fact that you developed a very dedicated online following early on i love you all if you're watching this you you are the best people and i am thrilled that you let me hang out with you and you know i think you have um when you went to writing they happily followed you 
when you got into podcasting, they happily followed you. Many of the, yes, well, and it was a progression. It was illustration, and then it was comics. Oh, and comics, I started, right. I started doing comics because uh, I'd never thought of doing comics before. I, I honestly hadn't. I mean, I, I had the, the absolutely cliche uh, awakening to comics of comics are for kids. Someone gave me Sandman. Okay, comics are for adults. Wow, this is amazing. Uh, okay, now I have read Hellblazer and Preacher and Books of Magic. And okay, yeah, this is fabulous. But obviously, I cannot do this because I do not draw well enough. And then I was in an argument with someone online. It may, of course, astonish anyone who knows me well to think I was ever arguing online. Uh, and I drew a small animal with a word balloon standing on top of a dinosaur skull screaming, it's got a brain the size of a walnut. And I stared at it and I thought, this is a comic. I could do more of these pictures with word balloons and they would be comics. And then I went and bought Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics and read it and immediately abandoned the idea because I was not cool enough to do comics. If you, I mean, it, it was total paralysis of there is so much you can do in this medium. Oh, my God. How could I possibly do anything? So I started by uh, telling myself that I was not going to the, 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 what I was doing was not a real comic. It was practice for a real comic. And I started drawing this little wombat, and I kept telling people not to get attached to the character because this was purely an experiment in drawing in black and white because it turned out color was really exhausting. And then it, nearly 800 pages later, it was Digger and an epic, and people got attached, and yeah. And then from the comic, People already knew I could tell a story, although apparently it took me eight years to do it. And so they followed for the writing and it just kind of kept going. Let's go back to Chicago when Digger won the Hugo. Yes. And the fact that you learned that comics were not for kids by reading The Sandman by Neil Gaiman. Oh, Lord, I see where this is going. And then to bring it all around when Digger, the comic you did because of what you learned from the Sandman, won the Hugo. How did you thank Neil Gaiman at that World Con? Okay, in my defense, I had been extremely nervous before the Hugos and had not been able to eat like all day. And so I, because I was just queasy and nervous and I didn't think I'd win, but what if I did and et cetera, et cetera. And then you sit in you're in an auditorium and you're sitting there queasy and nervous and gripping the hand of the person next to you uh which in this case was Mer's husband and my now husband uh and i believe jim said that he finally got feeling back in his fingers about two years later and you're you're queasy you're nauseated and then you get the award or you don't get the award and i've been on both sides now and it doesn't matter because all of a sudden when it's over, you're like, oh, thank God, and now I'm ravenous. I, like, I would eat uh, three cheeseburgers if they were in front of me. But you still have to wait to the next rest of the ceremony, which, because comics was, was fairly early on, meant that George R. R. Martin gave a very long rambling speech about how Game of Thrones came about, which involved like a course-by-course -course meal description with his producer. And by the end of all of that, I was ready to start gnawing on the chairs. So I went to the like Hugo after party thing and there was a nacho bar, but it was very close quarters because at that particular room con, they'd crammed us all into very, all the things into little hotel rooms instead of like, you know, ballrooms. So we were all trying to work around beds and, and chairs and things. And I had to get to the nacho bar before I died. And the only thing standing between me and it was a gentleman in a black suit that I saw with curly hair that I only saw from the back. And I was wearing, because it was a con and that was what I had for formal wear, a, a fairly uh, lifting corset. And if you are well endowed, as some of you may know, if you have a corset on, you can just kind of boob check people out of the way. And I 
I didn't mean to, but I might have kind of boob checked Neil Gaiman out of the way of the nacho bar. And uh, I mean, I said, excuse me, but like it was really loud in the room and, and there were nachos. And I turned and saw who it was and said, with one of the few times I have ever had wit on the spot, I will dine out for years on the story of how I trampled Neil Gaiman to get to the nacho bar. And he laughed, fortunately, and said, when you tell the story, please, by the end, have me on the floor weeping and covered in guacamole. So, uh, which, you know, to, I don't know if it's to your credit or to your, to, to your not credit. I don't know what the opposite of that is. But every time I've heard you tell the story, you tell it just like that. You don't, you say he tells you to embellish, but you never actually do. I think it's because he told me to. Oh, okay. Uh, and, but also, you know, I, uh, <laughs> he was a real person. I, I don't want to, like, over embellish the tale in case it ever gets back to him and he's like you know who is this story of this woman who who walked on me in spike heels while throwing guacamole at my head that didn't happen <laughs> although i would never wear spike heels i have bad ankles yes so um i'm just kind of bopping all over your career because it is strange and storied uh tell me if i'm if i'm skipping anything that you would like to talk about Aww. but um one of my favorite things to ask you is so what are you working on now ursula we only have <laughs> about uh 20 some minutes left so you'll have to sum up uh what what Murr is referring to and Murr and i are old friends so uh she she is aware of of my habits i uh i work on multiple projects at once and i know some people don't and i know there's often a common wisdom that uh if you're working on a project and you get stuck or you get tired you have to plow through that's the saggy middle don't start something new that's shiny and i have ignored that my entire life i uh if i have an excite if I think of an exciting shiny new idea I chase it like a beagle after a rabbit and I get as many words down as I can until it's not shiny anymore and then usually at that point I can go back to the first idea and I have figured out what was wrong or possibly the people who are giving me money for the first idea are going to be impatient if I don't start working on it and guilt is a great motivator as well I tend to work on uh, three to ten different projects at a time and some of them will be I, I will write something and then I don't trunk it it just goes in my in progress file I might not come back to it for a year I might not come back to it for five years but what I'm you know I'll get in the mood and I'll, or, or I'll just suddenly remember that one project and I'll go back and find it Sometimes, uh, as has happened in the past, I will have an editor say, what have you got that you, you know, can sell me? And I'll be like, uh, I got 15,000 words on this thing. You want me to write any more on it? Or, and I will send it to them. Sometimes, you know, if I get excited about a project and I've written X amount on it, uh, usually 15,000 words is about the magic spot. I will send it to my agent and be like, can you find someone to give me money to finish this? And... So that's just how I work. I will get an idea, I follow it, I skip back and forth. I don't have a problem working on multiple projects. Uh, I There was a stage where I was working on the last Hamster Princess book, which is for children, and The Hollow Places, which was my first horror novel. I had both Word docs open. I would write a couple paragraphs on one until I didn't know exactly what the next line would be. I would switch to the other one. I would write a paragraph or two. And once I didn't know exactly what happened next, usually I'd figured it out on the other one by then. So I was just flipping back and forth. I don't get them mixed up. It's, uh, it's not a problem. I know there are people who have to do a single deep dive on one project and great, you know, that works for you. For me, I like to bop all over the place. And the nice thing about that is that at any given time, I probably have a book that is somewhere nearing completion and so I don't have to start every project with, I don't have to go in cold and, and be like the blank page is, is awaiting me. Uh, I, I did in fact recently have to go in cold on a book because uh, a, uh, another horror author had wanted a 
horror novel and I had like one idea for a scene which I pitched them over the phone and they were like yes that will write you a contract and I was like okay oh I see what happened you wanted to write me a contract for something but you just needed something with a title you could sell to marketing or, or contracts or whatever okay so I uh now I have to write the book cold and it's actually really difficult because I haven't had, you know, a couple of years of it marinating in the back of my brain until I know exactly what's going on. And uh, I am finding it much more challenging than my usual method of just uh, write whatever, shove it somewhere, come back. And it's worked itself out through lots of lying awake at night. And instead of, you know, running through horrible anxiety of what terrible thing could be happening, run through what would happen next in a book. It's uh, that's how I do a lot of my pre-writing is basically lying in bed with insomnia, trying not to worry about the end of the world. So, yay. Okay. Um, now, this is actually done in, in, I mean this seriously, even though, again, it was another thing in your career that went, it came from a weird spot and ended up at a weird spot. But um, by the time you guys see this, uh, we will know whether Ursula has won the Andre Norton Nebula Award. Um, but right now, it's right before Nebula Weekend as we we're recording this, so we don't know. But there, I still think of it as the Bread Wizard book because you've oh, totally talked lie. about it for so many years. But um, what oh, defensive Wizards. Wizards got a defensive baking? Yes, yes. I got yeah. it. Um, it. <laughs> I've asked this before, but that was a joke. And now I'm serious. Tell us the story of that book, but is there anything you think you've learned from this Bread Wizard experience that you could pass on to anybody else because it's an awesome story? Or is it just another weird, you rolled a, a natural crit, you just didn't know like, it like I, seven years ago? Yeah, that might be it. Um, so Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking started out because... I, in 2007, I want to say, because I really wanted a to write off a KitchenAid mixer as a business expense. I and, did not know that part. <laughs> well, it was the red KitchenAid mixer. And at the time, I was having to learn to cook for myself because I was newly divorced. And I was like, okay, I yeah, I, anyway. So uh, the only way I can think of doing that, since I was at the time a children's book author, was to write a fantasy novel about a wizard who worked with bread. And uh, the, it, it went, it, 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 it had legs. I got excited about it. I wrote, you know, eh, 30, 40,000 words as usual. I, and it, it took, gosh, uh, I think it was like until 2012 before I finished it. So it was about four years uh, because I was working on the Dragon Breath books and everything. And those were very time consuming. And so I, uh, and Digger and everything else, and sold it to the publisher who wanted it, but also did not know what to do with it. And did the thing that I often hear, which is we like this, but we don't know how to market it. And after, and, and they sat on it for a couple of years, trying to figure it out, and no shade on them, they were really trying to figure out how to make this work. They had bought it in sort of, I think, an excess of enthusiasm because Dragon Breath 1 had done so well. And then they wound up with this story that they were like, this isn't quite middle grade, but it's also definitely not YA. Uh, let's age her way down. Let's try to make it less scary. But also let's try to make, but OK, there's a lot of things that are really kind of dark about this story. So let's let's work with those. And so we were getting pulled in two different directions. My editor was trying really hard. She And meanwhile, the Dragon Breath books are selling. And they she could not figure out what to do with it. She was sending it to other departments saying, do you have any thoughts? And they were coming back with, we like this, but we don't know what to do with it. And finally, my agent was like, look, you've had it for four years. Uh, just we will sell you another book and you will give this one back to us. And my editor said that would be for the best. And then so, she went to the nearest elevator, got on, and, <laughs> no. and just said, you know, yeah. Well, so. actually, ironically, I got more money uh, than, uh, <laughs> because uh, for the book that I resold them because 
Uh, I had been at the start of my children's book career when I sold them the first one, and now the books have done well, and we'd already had the elevator incident. So they, I wound up getting the book back plus like $5,000. So, you know, I was like, hey, this isn't shabby. I'll, I'll take that. And then my editor tried to sell the book to other children's book houses, and they kept saying, we like this, but we don't know how to market it. Uh, we don't know what to do with this. And most of them were going... We really like those Dragon Breath books. Uh, we would buy this one as like a second or third book from Ursula, but we would prefer something like the Dragon Breath books first. And uh, I could not do any more uh, Dragon Breath books than I did because they were taking me like a month to write and then three months to draw of just daily. You know, I, I was having to draw 150 dragons a book and I was burning out so hard that smoke was coming out of my ears. So I, I, she shopped it around, didn't go anywhere, and it finally sat for a while. And I hadn't self-published it because I wasn't sure if she was still shopping it around. I had gotten distracted. I had self-published a fair number of other things by then. And then 2020 landed, and all of a sudden we were really into sourdough starters and distrusting the government. And I was like, wait a minute, I have a book for this. And I did not do a lot of changes to it. People, you know, think like, well, are like, did you do a lot of edits from like back in 2012? I'm like, no, I, I added like maybe two scenes. It, most of the stuff was there already. So, and, and it did amazingly. Like it, it, Andre Norton uh, uh, nomination and uh, it's on like the Locust list and it got a Hugo, uh, the, the not a Hugo Lone Star nomination. It, it's like, this book has gone places and sold amazingly. And I'm like, okay, uh, apparently this book was just sitting and waiting for 2020. And possibly the moral of that story is that not uh, a book is often not lost. It is just waiting for its, it is biding its time. And I, I really hope that there is not another convergence of factors like there was in the summer of 2020, but yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I would happily have skipped all of that and had the book languish in obscurity, but I am really glad that it could uh, uh, be there if we were having to go through that. And yeah, it uh, that was when it needed to exist, apparently. So maybe the story is sometimes, maybe the moral is sometimes in your career, you have to write for the right time for a book to land. Wow, we really did come out of that with a lesson learned. We did. I'm proud. <laughs> and also, uh, don't be afraid to decide to write a book so you can write off a KitchenAid mixer. Yeah. I still have yeah. the mixer. My, my husband has taken over it because he took over all the cooking because I'm terrible at it, but he still uses the KitchenAid mixer. <laughs> I just didn't know the thing about the mixer. I did not know that's that was the seed of this. Um, I, I, I don't want Other you to be such good stories about how meaningful their stuff was and how it's tied to their life and their grandmother and you know and growing up in in wherever and now i wanted a kitchen yeah yeah you did i think um i don't want you to be audited but if you ever do get audited can i can i come and watch <laughs> Fortunately, we are past the uh, the like ten year. Or oh, that's true. Years, so yeah, uh, I am I am safe now on that one. Yes, uh, my my accountant. I, I have a, a, a I call him my tax weasel. Who I go in once a year with all my stuff added up, and I'm like, anything I had a question about writing off, I ask him, and he just looks at me and he's like, was it for business? Yes. Okay. But sometimes it's like, do you wear that corset anywhere but business events? <laughs> yes. And no, it doesn't count as a business expense. <sighs> it's had this little IRS fairy following you, waiting to see when you put on that corset to make sure that it is for uh, a business event. I was younger then and wore corsets more frequently. Yeah. These days, I'm like, I think T. Kingfisher wears a hat and a suit everywhere. I'd be wearing a suit now, but it's it's uh, very humid and warm out, and I wanted to sit in the garden for the interview. Yes, it is lovely. Thank you. Um, 
So have we have we missed any of the key points of your career that uh, need to be told? I, the I... problem is that I don't know. Uh, like many things, uh, frequently in my childhood, I don't realize something is weird until I try to explain it to someone else. Ah, uh, yes. And uh. and then you're like, you keep talking, and everyone is staring at you with that expression, and you're like, okay, in retrospect. The uh, the story about the the one weird yoga instructor with the cannibalism and the chakra underwear is a very weird story. Hmm. But I, I did realize we did forget one thing. Um, you have one Hugo since the digger one. Yes. Um, a Hugo. One, one, well, yeah, the one, one yeah. in uh, Helsinki. Yes, uh, that was for the Tomato Thief, which is a novelette, uh, and which was the sequel to Jackalope Wives. Oh God, yeah, here's another one. Um, so I did not realize I wrote short stories. I had never written a short story as far as I was concerned. I had a live journal. I wrote weird little vignettes on my live journal. They were not short stories. They were just things I wrote on my live journal. They were blog posts. And I wrote a fair number of those, and then a friend of mine who was a live journal follower was like, I just took over editing a uh, magazine, it was Apex, I need you to write, I want to commission a story from you. And I'm like, do I write stories? And she's like, yes, one of these things. I'm like, oh, those live journal posts, gotcha. And she told me what she wanted, and it was like a lot of things and I had no idea how I wrote the short stories they had just been vague ideas I had that I wrote a blog post about but obviously this nice person was asking and I had to write it because I liked Sigurd and Sigurd was lovely so I uh, got an idea basically while watching my husband get tattooed about skins and skin changers and selkies except I don't like the ocean but I do like the desert, so I started writing about uh, skins changing jackalopes in the desert and what happens if you take their skin off and because uh, people are always like, you have to burn the skin so that they stay human, but what if you don't do burn it all the way? What happens then? And they put it on and it's half burned. What, what? And uh, so that became Jackalope Wives, which... Uh, sort of launched my short story career, and then the sequel to that, The Tomato Thief, uh, won the, the the Hugo, yes. Yeah. Uh, and then editors learned at the ceremony where I, because uh, Jack Love Wives won a Nebula, oh God, I'm so sorry. Uh, this is, this is, none of my career makes any sense. <laughs> I, the editors there were like, I think the nice people from Uncanny were like, you should write us a story. And I'm like, I should. Sorry, there's a bug. Uh, I'm like, yes, that is a thing I could do. And then they followed up on it and asked me for one. And I was like, oh, God, now I have to write them a story. So I wrote a story and sent it to them. Uh, with a note that said, you said you wanted a thing. I don't know if this is the thing you want. If you don't like it, I'll write you a different thing. And they published that, and uh, virtually all of my short stories now basically arise from an editor asking me to write them one, including you. And so uh, the only moral to this story is that after a point, apparently editors will realize that you will not submit things to them. They will have to shake you until the story falls out. And I am glad that all of my editor friends realized this early on because, like I said, guilt is a great motivator. So the fact that they want to think means that there are many more short stories in the world than there would be otherwise. So one thing I've wanted uh, cons to do, and I don't think anybody's doing it yet, is um, give a sort of pro writer, you know, 201 class. And one of those uh, classes that I would like to take I believe like, the I, Nebula Weekend does that, actually, but go on. Do they talk about award speeches? Oh, because I don't know if they do that, no. no. one tells you about award speeches. No one tells you what you should do. You only have watching people, and then you've got 
movie stars who name everybody and their key grip until the music starts and they get pulled off the stage. And you're like, well, that's not how you do it. And you went another way. So <laughs> t- t- tell, tell that story. But also, I mean, I, w- I want to know how you come up with your, uh, I- I'm not going to ask you how you come up with your story ideas. I want to know how you come up with your award acceptance speech ideas. Oh, uh, well, I made one heartfelt speech for Digger and uh, that that was the end of my, I, I did not have anything heartfelt to say. I had thanked my husband enormously and uh, kind of proposed to him, I guess, on accident. And As uh, you would. As I would. Uh, he said yes. And I said, to what? And he said, you asked me to marry you in the speech. And I said, I did. <laughs> and he said, you said I should probably marry him and that's as good as it's going to get. So yes, I will marry you. I'm like, yay, great. Uh, so, uh, everything I do is by accident, clearly. I, so after that, um, the poet, uh, the poet laureate, Billy Collins said once of his poetry that when he was young, he had lots of things to say, and then he ran out of things to say, and his poetry improved immeasurably. (laughs) And I sort of feel like award speeches for me, uh, I... I cannot match the, I am, I am a very frivolous person in many regards. I cannot match the incredibly heartfelt, meaningful speeches that many people give. And I am thrilled they do that. I am, however, good comic relief. And so I am, I am the, the sort of, you know, the, the joke section. And so I just talk about things that are interesting and I happen to think dead whales are interesting. Well, whale fall, rather the phenomenon where the the whale dies and sinks to the bottom of the ocean and all the hundreds of scavengers that show up that are often never seen anywhere else but on a dead whale. And uh, so I figured if I was interested in it, maybe everyone else would be. And I think also you and I had gotten together to write potential award speeches and Mm -hmm. I had, uh, uh, Saki may have been involved. Yes, it was. And so it just seemed like a good idea to write this speech about whale fall. And then, and also I never think I'll win. So that, uh, that makes it a lot easier to write a speech because I just write a fun speech. Uh, for example, when Jack Love Wives won the Nebula, I had written the speech for the uh, alternate universe Nebulas, which is a, a thing they do afterwards where people read the speeches they would have given if they had won. So they read the speech from the alternate universe. And I was like, it's an alternate universe. So I had written it as if everyone in the audience was a giant chicken. And uh, I had to hastily amend my speech when I had to actually give it in real time. Although I, I think I said, please hold your clucks till the end of the, the speech. Oh. So uh, yeah. And Whale Fall was just another one like that. And I have learned over the years, I am fairly good at giving a extemporary I, I, I'm, I'm recently good at public speaking because uh having to do all of these children's events at schools and whatnot and if you can work in front of an audience of middle schoolers uh you you can work anywhere yeah so uh, yeah all i have to do is be funny and interesting and whale fall is interesting and uh when minor mage got nominated i had a whole speech about armadillos and leprosy it didn't win, but the, uh, the I, there was an armadillo in the book. It I, I'm with you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. But um, while your career is nothing anybody could ever follow, <clears throat> and while you're so damn talented without even trying that it's almost disgusting, you are still <laughs> one of the best creators in genre today, and you are one of the nicest and... ReaderCon's lucky to have you. I'm sorry they couldn't have you in person, but um, you've Someday. made science fiction and fantasy really a lot weirder. So uh, thank you for all the work you do, Ursula. Uh, thank you for the interview, Mirror. That's one of the nicest things anyone said about me. 